the reading of Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. As we light the third Advent candle, we hear these words of enrichment. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. Your prophets spoke of a day when the desert would bloom and the waters would break forth in the wilderness. As we light these candles in our homes, may they warm our places of worship as we prepare to receive your coming into the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We say together the prayer of the day. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. When John, when John the, Baptist the Baptist pointed the way toward you, he set the example for all of us in living a life worthy of your gospel. Remind us of that gospel every day and inspire us to shine its light through everything that we may say and do. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen.
with him work so uh, first I want to look at some things and I'm going to look at this yes that's the child right there better known as Grogu now which is a silly name but anyway this is an air plant and it doesn't need soil to live but it does need yes it needs air but it also needs water and you water it like once every one or two weeks and or if you're like me you do it every three weeks and if it doesn't get water you know every two or three weeks then it's going to not work in other words it will die and wither away which is not cool all right next this tree behind me what does that need to work well that needs that <laughs> That needs electricity for those lights to work. All right, no electricity. There's not going to be. The tree won't be as pretty. I don't think. I mean, it'll still be cool, but it won't be as pretty. All right, and let's see. Next, we have this candle. Now, what does the candle need to work? Well, yeah, it needs a flame, but in order for the flame to keep burning, what does it need to work? Well. It needs air, and without air, what happens? The flame goes out. All right? No pretty candle. So just like this candle needs air to work, um, we don't want our relationship with God to go out like uh, lack of air made this candle to go out. So um, how, what does it take to get our relationship with God to work? Well, I have the answer, and you guessed it. It's in the Bible, and it's in uh, a book that I have a hard time saying. It's in 1 Thessalonians, did it? Uh, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, and it says, Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, so it says we need to pray, okay? So uh, sometimes we think about uh, prayer as um, something we do when we just, we need something. Maybe uh, you have a friend who's sick and you pray for that friend to get better. And that's, that's good. God wants us to pray for other people to help them. And that's all well and good. But he also wants us to give him thanks and uh, I don't think we really do that enough a lot of people do but you know I'm learning how to do that more and more and I found the more I talk to God the more comfortable I feel with him it's it's and it's a pretty awesome feeling because if you have God with you you're like never alone so um, I think uh, I think we should talk to God every day about what we're doing and how our day is going. Um, you can thank him for um, talking to a friend over uh, Zoom, or you can thank God for talking to a friend over however you guys chat these days, because I'm a little older than you. Uh, so I really don't know about all this stuff, but you can also thank him for your parents, your grandparents, uh, your pets. I have one over here. Well, I'm not going to move it, but uh, I thank God every day for my dog, Roxy, because she makes me happy. And I think we should thank God for all the things that make us happy. And also for things that don't make us happy, but that's a lesson for another day. 
Um, now, when you start praying consistently, you get to know God better. And I know that sounds kind of strange, but it's true. Um, when I talk to uh, my friends, and I do it as much as I can, I feel better. And I get to know them. The more I talk to a friend, the better I get to know that person. Well, the more you talk to God, um, the better you get to know him. And sometimes you might feel a little strange talking to God, but if you think of God as your friend, and not some strange almighty being, um, then it's a lot easier. And I, uh, you know, God is almighty. He created everything. And I don't want you to think that he's not almighty, but he's also your friend. And I think it makes it much easier to talk to God if he's your friend. And like I said earlier, I talk to my friends. So um, just remember, let's thank God for everything that we have and let's do it more consistently although if you're in the store and you like oreos like i do you might want to not well you can thank him right then and there but people might look at you strange but it's okay too because uh, god's awesome all right so um let's just remember to thank god daily and talk to him he's your friend okay let's pray heavenly father we want to thank you for being our friend Thank you for our parents, grandparents, and all the people that love us. Most of all, thank you for Jesus because he's pretty awesome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I hope you guys have an awesome, awesome Christmas. And uh, I hope we see each other in Sunday school sometime in 2021. Bye. Our gospel reading today is from the first chapter of John, verses 6 to 8, and then skipping down to verses 19 to 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, Who then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. And they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is the second week in a row that we are hearing from John the Baptist, who is proclaiming, announcing the coming of the Lord. He says both in Mark last week and in John this week, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. He's quoting there from the prophet Isaiah. And so as we think about this, the coming of the Lord and, and John's proclamation, I'd like to invite you to think about this in, in four ways. First of all, who is coming? Obviously, it's the Lord, but what does that mean? And then secondly, what are the conditions? What is the situation into which this Lord is coming? And third, what is the impact of the Lord's coming on our circumstances, on our situation? And then finally, what is asked of us? So taking the first one, who is coming, we heard last week, Mark's gospel begins, that, that this gospel message from, from Mark is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So the first thing we know about this Lord is that this is God. This is Emmanuel, God with us. And that's an important thing to know and to understand. Secondly, 
from the prophet Isaiah chapter 61, we know that this Lord is one who comes to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And then in the Gospel of John, actually the verse right after our reading today ended, John looks and he sees Jesus coming and he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this this Lord is the Lamb of God. Think back to the Exodus and and how the Lamb was, was killed and the blood from the Lamb was painted on the doorpost. And this was all in preparation for the Exodus, for coming out of of slavery coming out and being delivered from slavery in Egypt. The last thing to consider about who is coming, who this Lord is, is that this is a Savior. And it's important for us to understand that we need a Savior. I've started reading again this year A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And on the first page, he starts out by, by telling us that Marley is dead. Dead as a doornail. And he says that this must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. And it's the same for us with this Christmas story, with the coming of the Lord, the Christ child, that we need to understand our need for a Savior. We need to understand this or nothing wonderful comes from this Christmas story. So with who is coming and understanding that, the next question is what are the conditions? What is the situation into which the Lord comes? What does the Lord find when he gets here? Now we struggle maybe with, with uh, acknowledging that we need a Savior. Most of us would say that I'm doing the best I can, that I'm trying to be a good person. And again, I think most of us can say that. And yet, if we look at our communities, if we look at our nation as a whole, we can see that there are strains in our society. The fabric seems today to be almost tearing. Will it actually come apart is a valid question today. Some ways to maybe think about this and help to flesh this out, maybe you've heard that America, even though we are the richest nation on earth, we are not particularly happy. There's a World Happiness Report. I think it comes out of Forbes magazine. And for the third year in a row, Finland has been rated the happiest country in the world. Second and third are Denmark and Switzerland. The U.S. comes in at a lowly number, number 18. It is an improvement. Last year, apparently, we were number 19. But why aren't we particularly happy? We're the richest nation in the world, and yet we're not happy as many others. Another way to think about this is in life expectancy, that, that the way our society operates, that we are able to live long and happy lives. Something called World O Meters Info places Hong Kong and Japan saying the life expectancy in those places is 85 plus years. At 84 years, Switzerland and Italy, and I think there's some others mixed up in there as well. The U.S. is a lowly, again, a lowly 46th, coming in at 79 years in change. We are just behind Cuba and just ahead of Panama. I don't know that we would expect to find ourselves in such company. If we think, another way to think is in terms of this pandemic that is, is raging throughout our country and how so many of us seem unwilling to do what is best for the whole. We're worried about ourselves and our own rights and liberties, and we refuse to think of the community as a whole and what might be best for all of us. I think it's true we are doing our best. We are trying to be good people. But these are examples that maybe it's not going very well for us. In other words, we need a Savior. And this must be distinctly understood, especially at this Christmas time to give us a frame to think about this, this need of a Savior. Isaiah 59 begins, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his, nor his ear too dull to hear. 
But, verse 2 says, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have separated, our sins have separated us from our God. Verse 9 says, so justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. We look for justice, but find none. For deliverance, but it is far away. So think in terms of the ills of our country as injustice. Think of the sins that we are guilty of as injustice. Think of division and separation based on on race, based on on wealth or poverty. Think of racism and anti-Semitism, of the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots. All of these have kind of been put on the back burner because of our recent election and this pandemic that is, is taking up all of our attention. But these are still very much a part of our society. Our refusal to help those who are, are immigrants and refugees, our refusal to deal with climate change. Think of all this in terms of injustice. We are doing our best. We are trying to be good people. But we need a savior. So third, what is the impact of the Lord's coming? Staying with, with chapter 59 in Isaiah for a little bit longer, the Lord looked and, and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him. And then it goes on a little bit later, the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins declares the Lord. We need a Savior, and John proclaims our Savior comes. And to offer a frame to think about this coming Savior, think of our baptism. After all, where John is preaching is at the Jordan River and as he baptizes. And this is where Jesus comes and, and makes his entrance in, on the scene, and, and he too is baptized. So for our baptism, we use, of course, water, and this is a washing. It's a cleansing. We are made clean. Thinking thinking again of Dickens' A Christmas Carol, my understanding of 19th century London was that they used to warm their homes and and buildings, they used coal often as as fires. And so the chimneys of London were, were belching all this coal smoke, and this soot would get on all the buildings and make them extremely dirty and... and, um, so that every few decades or 100 years or whatever, they have to be cleaned. And I think it's still the same today. We find impurities in our own air, smog and, and all of these other issues and, and the very air that we breathe. We can see evidence um, on our buildings today as well. Think of these as metaphors for our lives and the injustice and the sin that infects us, that stains our lives and, and our communities and our nation. And what baptism does for us is it washes us clean, giving us a new lease on life, a fresh start. And think about ways that, that we experience a fresh start and a new lease on life, like getting out of the hospital, for example, with a clean bill of health, or starting a new job with prospects and possibilities. Think about beginning a new stage of life, graduating from high school and moving on to university or, or getting a job that first well-paying job that puts money in the bank for us, or getting married, or like I said last week, having a new baby. These are all a new stage of life, new opportunities, new possibilities. For us today, we dream about what it will be like after the pandemic is finally over and we can resume a normal life. We will have a, a new start, a fresh start once we come out of this pandemic. In other words, these are all examples about new beginnings and all that goes with us, goes with it, the possibilities, the opportunities, the fresh start. John says of Jesus, he sees him coming towards him and he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are made new. We are made clean. We have a new start. And so what is this fresh start, this new lease on life? What is asked of us? Do we turn back to our old ways? 
Hopefully not. We are called to turn back to God. That's what John was doing. We have, have strayed, we've been distracted, we have other priorities that have gotten in the way. This pandemic, for example, is an opportunity to reflect. We've been enforced, we have an enforced slowdown. We aren't as busy as we have been. Once this has passed us, will we just go back to the way things were or will we have a new approach to life? In the same way, our Savior has come. Will we embrace a new way to live or will we just go back to the old ways, the old ways that have resulted in injustice that in all the ways that I mentioned before? Will we adopt a new way of life? John says in verse 26 that our Lord has come and he actually stands among us and yet we do not know him. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us and we haven't recognized God with us. God among us. So the call is, John's call is to turn and to know God in our midst, to seek God with the promise that if we do, we will find God. And in finding God, then we are able to to receive and to live this, this new way of life that we have been given. Two examples of maybe what that can look like and, and to give you something to, to kind of wrap your mind around. If injustice in our world today is found in division and separation, in an inability to see others and to see their plight, their situation, to empathize with them and and to care enough to try to do something about it, then working, if that is injustice, then working for justice might be finding a way to be the bridge. Be the Bridge is, is an organization started by a woman called Latasha Morrison, who saw within the church a separation between white Christians and black Christians. And so she started an organization to try to bridge that gap, to bring races together and, and help them to know each other and, and to form relationships and communities and to form harmony and unity together. Another example, if injustice is found in the way that we in self-righteousness, look in judgment on others. We see the ills of our society and we find somebody to blame and we judge them. Then working for justice, if, again, if that's injustice, then working for justice might be finding ways to call in instead of to call out. That is, is something that a woman named Loretta Ross, she is a professor at Smith College, she is speaking against calling out and and the cancel culture in our society today. And she instead is urging a calling in as a way to work for justice. So these are two examples of what it means to, to find God in our midst and to recognize God's ways. To work for justice, in other words, and to counter injustice. Now, in closing, again, we've had John for two weeks. He has been proclaiming, make straight the way of the Lord. Get ready to receive this coming Savior, in other words. John wasn't starting a new religion, however. He was proclaiming a turning back to God. Remember that that license plate holder I talked about a couple of weeks ago, that God allows U-turns. And, and John is calling for repentance and a turning back to God. Luther was doing the same thing in the 16th century as he was trying to reform an old religion, not start a new one. And this was a turning back to God, recommitting to God and to God's ways. We have the same thing today and in our more contemporary times. Matt Redman is a songwriter, and, and back in the late 20th century, he wrote a song called The Heart of Worship. And that came out of the struggle within his church over what was the best music to have in worship, what was the right music. And so the congregation was arguing about this. And so the church decided to just set music aside altogether for a period of time. And the purpose was to get back to the center of worship, to get back to the heart of worship. And so we do that oftentimes both in the church and outside in our society as well. We, we argue about secondary things and we have lost sight of what is at the center. 
And so John and Luther and, and other contemporaries in our, our world today are calling us to turn back to God, to receive our Savior. After all, we need a Savior. Hopefully that's clear by now. And Christmas is about the coming of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. And so we are urged to turn back to God and to receive this Savior. Amen. We continue with our prayers. As members of the body of Christ gathered in our homes and around the world, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all those in need. God Almighty, you sent us John the Baptist to be a voice crying out in the wilderness, calling us to you. As we continue through this Advent journey, may his words bring us peace as we move forward to your promised future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, through the waters of baptism, you have knit your people together in a beautiful tapestry of diversity across time and space. As we continue to feel isolated and separated during this current pandemic, hold us tightly in your arms and remind us that we are still connected to each other through our faith and by your promises and your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Maker of all things, all you have made is good, and yet evil and sin have made a home in our world. Be with all those who are weighed down by the power of sin. Be with all those who know, we know who cry out to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need in the name of the one who sets us free. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pour out again today your spirit on us and on all the world. Unite into one body, people of every nation and tongue for your kingdom work of renewal and restoration. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Even as we watch and wait, Christ is here. And so you are invited. Come and eat. Come and drink. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you you could have come to us in your full glory. Instead, you were born to a young, impoverished girl among animals in a stable. You could have chosen a palace. Instead, you became a refugee, fleeing to Egypt to escape violence. You could have revealed yourself as the king of creation and demanded our obedience. Instead, you presented yourself to John de John the Baptist for baptism as we work to prepare your way help us to remember your humility help us to remember that as we look for your coming we just might find you among the humble the poor and the marginalized in our own society that our actions might reflect our desire for you however you present yourself to us amen and now the Lord bless you and keep you The Lord's unfailing love rest upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
in peace. Prepare the way for the Lord. Thanks be to God.